And to answer the question about whether the United States is beginning to feel a little bit more isolated on the world stage by refusing calls for a ceasefire, Kurt Volker was the former US ambassador to NATO, and he's there. Hello, Mr. Volker, very good to see you. Can I ask you, first of all, when you look at the, the wide range of countries now calling for a ceasefire, a lot of the so-called global South, the African Union, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Turkey, and, and indeed some European countries like Ireland and Norway, um, do you, uh, are you concerned that the United States, along with Britain, is now looking rather isolated at the United Nations? Um, I'm not concerned about that. Uh, as your guest already said, this is par for the course. When, when we look at votes in the UN, the pro-Palestinian slant in the UN, the anti-Israeli slant in the UN, this has been going on for years and years and years. So we're not too surprised about this. And I think we have to have some fortitude to say, no, Israel is going to survive. It's going to have its own uh, sovereignty and territory, and it is going to defend itself and that we stand by their right to do so. So I think that's the, the one side not so concerning. What I am concerned about is that the messaging um, from the West has been to tell the Israelis, no, hold on, be careful, deal with the hostages first. Don't attack Iran. Don't attack Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah. Uh, don't make this a regional war. And I think that all of that signaling is being read by Iran and Hezbollah as weakness on the part of the West and therefore encouraging them even further. Well, that's very interesting. Now, I know you know Russia pretty well as well. And we had the, the, we had the meeting yesterday between Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad and Hamas in Lebanon. And today we read that Hamas representatives, along with Iranians, are having a meeting meetings in Moscow. Um, and I just wonder how you decode that, what you make of that. Well, Russia is making a play now. Um, they, first off, they're dependent upon Iran. Uh, when you look at their attacks against Ukraine, the only things that work are missiles that they have relatively few of now uh, and Iranian drones. And, and then lots of people to throw at the front line. So they are really dependent upon Iran. They seem to have decided to throw their lot in with the Iran, Syria, Lebanon side of this against mm -hmm. Israel and the West. Um, this is a big change. Israel had been trying to maintain a good relationship with Russia as well as with the United States and the West. Uh, I think Russia has broken that now. now it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And it may indeed mean that more Israeli help will be coming to Ukraine. Uh, and when it comes to Iran itself, again, can you decode what they're doing? Because their language was very fiery a couple of days ago, and they've gone a little bit quieter. And I wonder whether they are concerned about the possibility of having to go toe to toe with the Israelis and therefore perhaps one day with the Americans as well. That's exactly right. I completely agree with your analysis there. The Iranians have, have encouraged and wanted to see these attacks against Israel. They would like to get away with it now. And so they are trying to do things that will um, slow down or perhaps stop any wider response. And for example, what, what Hamas is doing, letting a few hostages out every few days, um, they are trying to drag this out so that Israel's ground invasion is delayed, world opinion swings against Israel, and it di diminishes, in their minds, the possibility of Iran becoming directly involved. Mm. Uh, I do worry that there's a scenario here, though, where Israel does go in against Gaza, and it's a big invasion. Hezbollah mm -hmm. launches thousands of missiles against Israel, and Israel responds not only by attacking Hezbollah, but by attacking Iran as well. And then we are in that scenario where perhaps the U.S. gets dragged in to help defend Israel. And that is presumably what uh, Vladimir Putin was talking about today when he issued this rather strange statement saying there's an enormous tide of destruction coming which will spill over beyond the Middle East, he said, and, you know, cause mayhem and destruction everywhere. Now, he always says these yeah. things for effect, but I wonder what kind of effect you think he's hoping for. Well, it, well I'm not sure he's hoping for it. What he's hoping to do is to deter us. He wants to send a signal to the U.S. in particular, also to the U.K., the West more broadly, that we should be putting pressure on Israel not to launch this. So he's saying it's going to be cataclysmic, it's going to be global, it's going to be terrible. Um, 
he's saying that not because it will actually be true or that he's right in his analysis. He's saying it to get us to act to put pressure on Israel. Yeah. Uh, and finally, since you are the U.S. guy at uh, United Nations, can I ask what might seem a silly question, which is, does the United Nations really matter in all of this? Because from the outside, it seems that whatever America proposes, Russia and China immediately veto, and whatever they propose, America vetoes. And in effect, in effect therefore, the Security Council is kind of paralyzed when it comes to Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to be clear, I was at NATO, not at the UN, but I, I, I agree beg with your what pardon. you there as well, too. It's okay. Um, but the, the United Nations Security Council was fundamentally broken. Uh, you have two permanent members with veto rights who are in flagrant violation of the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. And that means that we are not going to see the United Nations play the role that the founders of the UN hoped for back when it was created in 1949. And I don't see at the moment any way this gets fixed. Um, any move to change the makeup of the Security Council would be subject to the very same veto by the members that have that veto right. Uh, and it, changing the composition, adding new members, that's always been on the table as well. Mm. Countries like India, like Brazil, like Germany, they all want to be there. And I don't see any way of doing that without making somebody else mad. Uh, the only way the UN really becomes constructive again is for those two permanent members who are violating its principles to change. And if they become aligned with the purposes and principles of the Charter, then there's hope for the UN. But until we don't, until we no longer have Putin in Russia and uh, the way that she is leading China right now, uh, I, I just don't see it. A happy thought, but perhaps a different planet from the one we currently inhabit. <laughs> exactly. Kurt Volker, Kurt Volker uh, US, former U.S. ambassador to NATO. Thank you very much indeed for talking to me.